Okay, so good morning everyone. Um, so I will uh, give today uh, two talks. One uh, is a pretty broad introductory lecture on spatial cell types in the uh, hippocampal formation and the other one after the coffee break will be about kind of our, our own work uh, on bats. And so the first talk will have very little bats and it will be pretty broad and I think as all introductory lectures, uh, lectures I already apologize, it will be <laughs> very basic and I'm not going to go into uh, details, I rather have time if you have any questions, things are not clear about these concepts of what these cells are doing, I think it's better to, to discuss and to tell you some more detail about uh, place cells or grid cells. So, uh, so let's start. So what I will tell you in the, uh, in the first talk is... Um, uh, I'll start with a, a little uh, a background about the, the hippocampus and kind of the historical path that led us to think that it's related to, uh, to navigation. It wasn't that, you know, clear <laughs> 100 years ago. Um, 100 years ago, actually, an olfactory hypothesis prevailed, but we'll get to that. Uh, then uh, we'll talk about the various cell types, uh, place cells, uh, heterection cells, grid cells, and I'll mention some other cell types. Okay. So uh, this is the hippocampus in the rat in this case. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we have uh, two of them. This is uh, just one uh, on the left hemisphere in this case, uh, kind of a sausage that lies uh, underneath the cortex. Um, and uh, in another kind of view, uh, you see it again <coughs> in the rat uh, brain. Uh, this purple sausage is the hippocampus, and it's uh, connected uh, a very strongly, and I'll, I'll come back to it, to medial toronal cortex, essentially. The information coming from outside goes through the medial, most of it goes through the medial toronal cortex to the hippocampus, then back to the medial toronal cortex and to the rest of the, of the cortex. Um, and we know that these uh, areas are uh, important uh, for spatial memory and memory in general and navigation. I'll get to the, the evidence for this uh, soon. The structure of the hippocampus is highly conserved across mammals, and this has been quantified in detailed track tracing, so I'm just showing you some pictures of missile <laughs> stains, but this statement goes beyond just, just these pictures. Uh, really, it's an extremely conserved, across, ma across mammals, it's extremely conserved structure, but here, just to get an impression, in, in our bats, in rats, and even in, in Yechidna, in, in one of those Australian, uh, this is for you, <laughs> Eric, one of those Australian egg-laying uh, mammals, so uh, as ancient as, uh, as you can think of mammals, still looks uh, very similar. So it's really conserved, and again, I say the connectivity in generally is, is also very highly conserved, as opposed to many parts of, uh, you know, neocortex, uh, for example. So, um, and as we already discussed, uh, it exists also in birds, or a homolog of hippocampus exists also in birds and in reptiles, but it looks quite different. It definitely does not look like that. And there is some uh, inclarity about the homology. On the other hand, if you lead, as I'll, I'll show it, as in mammals, if you lesion this homolog in birds or in, uh, in reptiles, they have problems in spatial navigation. So they don't quite do the Morse water maze. They have other spatial types, but basically they have similar kinds of problems. So there's also functional evidence that for the similarity, but again, it's, it's not entirely clear. So as I said, the hippocampus is, uh, is, uh, has, this, uh, it has this interesting anatomical uh, 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 structure that's quite unusual it's compared to neocortex. So the information, I'm not now talking about the information that comes from the neocortex. By and large, and this is all drawing by Ramon Cajal, by and large, information comes from the internal cortex, is funneled to the various subfields of the hippocampus, the, the dentate, the C3, the C1, and then back to the uh, internal cortex. But this flow is largely unidirectional. So C3 projects to C1, but not backwards. Uh, dentate to C3, but not backwards. This is very different than uh, most of, uh, of uh, cortical regions. I mean, the general rule in the neocortex is if area A connects to area B, then area B connects back to area A. This is a general connectivity rule. And here it's, it's very unique and very different, this um, kind of unidirectional information flow. Um, the hippocampus is also a very high level brain area. This is one of the most famous diagrams in neuroscience. It's the Feldman and Van Essen. Uh, diagram of the visual system, actually, and this is usually kind of uh, shown, uh, I think, mostly to, uh, 
uh, kind of a, as a shock uh, <laughs> to <laughs> make you uh, gape at all at the complexity of the visual system. And, and indeed, you know, all the way uh, to, uh, to the uh, dorsal stream, the ventral stream. Um, it's really complex. But then if you look at the, very ups, at the very top of it, this little thing here, this is the hippocampus. So, so in fact, until information reaches the hippocampus, it goes through a, an enormous amount of, of processing. And this is true not just for the visual system, which is shown in this case, but similarly complex processing goes on in uh, the other sensory systems, except the olfactory, I'll get to this in a second, but the auditory system, etc. So there's a lot of processing until the information gets to the hippocampus. It's really a very, very high, high level uh, uh, brain area. And as I already mentioned, the, the, the one interesting um, exception is the olfactory input. So olfactory, there are direct projections from the olfactory bulb to the internal cortex. This is very unusual. And, and this was the main reason why, as I mentioned in the second, in the 1920s, there was this olfactory theory of, uh, of the hippocampal formation. People thought it's an olfactory structure. Um, only later we realized it's related to memory. <coughs> and so, you know, when you look at something like that, you'd immediately expect this will be, you know, response properties of neurons will be very complex. It'll be a mess. And so, I think you have to keep that in mind because although <laughs> it is <laughs> very complicated, the fact that we still have, um, you know, rather simple looking representations for space, for directions, is quite surprising given the, the huge amount of processing. So this kind of uh, expectation that everything will be absolutely impossible to understand um, does not match the anatomy. So it's kind of uh, something to remember. So. What were the, the early ideas about the hippocampal function? Kind of give you the, give, I'm giving you a one minute tour of the 20th century. So uh, initially the hippocampus in the 1920s was, was thought to be a part of the olfactory system, as I said, primarily on anatomical grounds because of this strong uh, input from the olfactory bulb to the internal cortex. In, in you know, cross species in both rats and monkeys. But on the other hand, uh, this is, people have abandoned this idea first because we now know it really received multisensory information. It's not just olfactory, so it's not an olfactory cortex of sorts. It received really multisensory information. And also, uh, there is a, a hippocampus in anosmic animals, so it doesn't seem to fit this idea. Then, in the 1930s and 40s, there was this idea of hippocampal and emotional processing, the so called Papel circuit, and it was thought to be uh, a part of the limbic system a term, a, a very problematic term that exists to this day. Um, the problem with this is really that there is no such thing as a limbic system. It's not a system. It's really a set of structures around the limbus of the ventricles, so around, around the a ventricle and there. Some of them are related to each other, some are not, but it's not really a system in any functional sense. And moreover, we now know that if anything, the amygdala is more important for emotional learning than the hippocampus. So again, this idea which was dominating in the 30s and 40s, was abandoned. And then in the 50s came evidence that hippocampus has to do with memory. And this really, the, the hero of this uh, revolution in our uh, thinking about hippocampus was uh, the, the, the famous patient uh, HM, Henry Molaison, uh, probably one of the two most uh, famous patients in the history of neuroscience who had, uh, was a young man in Canada, had an intractable epilepsy that he could not um, cure at the time with, uh, with drugs. And the source of that was in the hippocampus. So uh, a, a neurosurgeon in, um, Canadian neurosur neurosurgeon, Scoville, uh, had the idea, okay, so let's cut out both of the hippocampi and cure this guy from epilepsy. And today, there's a big uh, kind of controversy whether this was a good thing to do or not. There was this big uproar, some of you may have heard of it, it went all the way to the <laughs> newspapers, New York Times, et cetera, because his grandson of this guy published a book basically trashing <laughs> what his grandfather did. Anyway, it was a big controversy, but whether it's kind of ethical to cut out pieces of the brain, you have no idea what they're doing. But I think it's kind of, in retrospect, we, we think, may think this way, but at the time, there was still very strongly the olfactory hypothesis. And so I think, we sh I personally think it's not such an unreasonable thing to, to say, and sorry for that, <laughs> Anna, but if you have a really severe epilepsy, several attacks every, uh, every uh, day, 
and then you think that you have a surgery where you can make a person anosmic, because this is not a part of a uh, factory system, still uh, by some people around at that time, and cure this epilepsy, I mean, I think it's a reasonable trade-off. So I think it wasn't such a <laughs> terrible decision, but anyway, the result was very dramatic and very unexpected, and that is that uh, epilepsy, the epilepsy was almost cured, <coughs> but uh, so it worked. But what happened is that the guy did not become anosmic, but he essentially lost almost all ability to learn new things. He could still do motor learning, he could still do several forms of learning, which immediately taught us that there are several different memory systems in the brain, so this was a big breakthrough in this respect. Uh, so not all memory is the same, but still he could not learn episodic memory. So what happened to him yesterday? People could talk to him, meet him, get out of the room, come back, he had no idea who they are. So really a very, very dramatic case of amnesia, so dramatic that this was like N equals one <laughs> patient really uh, transformed our thinking about the hippocampus. Then came, of course, other patients, but this was like the, a unique, very dramatic example. Okay, so the hippocampus related to, to memory. Then, almost 50 years ago, Cannon came another uh, uh, very uh, seminal finding and a surprisingly simple one, or seemingly simple one, and that is a discovery by John O'Keefe of play cells. So basically, um, this is one of, one, of the, one of the papers of O'Keefe in the 70s. If you let <coughs> a, a rat run in an environment, uh, in a tea maze of, like this, uh, and you record where, uh, so this is really a freely behaving animal. He used one of these very first preamplifiers and amplifiers at the time, and the way they recorded the position where the animal was, what they had, a little a circuit that would emit light, they have a kind of threshold crossing whenever a spike uh, crossed it, so they emit a light and there was a silver plate that it would be impregnated. So it really was low tech, no computer, but it worked. And um, so they, if the, that's the way, of course, the first experiments were done. <laughs> Later the, uh, things changed. Um, you see that this particular example uh, neuron uh, is active whenever the rat is in a particular location. It looks like this neuron tells, you know, that the animal is here. So something about the position of the animal or the place of the animal. So they call these neurons place cells. Of course, today we do, it, we look at them somewhat differently. We, we let an animal, uh, this is from another study, we let an animal from Mueller lab in the, in the uh, uh, 90s or later uh, 80s, we let an animal run uh, in an uh, arena and we just count spikes, how many spikes were emitted by a particular neuron whenever the animal was in this, because it's kind of top view of a circular arena, so this is maybe a few centimeter by a few centimeter spatial bin, we count how many spikes occurred here, so this is kind of a map of spike count, we may ma count how much time the animal spent in each part of the arena, and then we just divide the two, maybe with a little bit of smoothing, and we get a, a firing rate map, so spikes divided by time, spikes per second, uh, at each location in the environment. So this is the typical kind of heat <coughs> maps that are used to represent these play cells. Um, and these are, uh, we know, pyramidal cells in the, uh, in the hippocampus that are doing that. So just to show you, let's see if that will work, how this looks in reality. This is from, the, uh, from Laura Colgin from the, when she was in the Moser lab. Show you how a play cell looks in, uh, in reality. You hear that? Yes, on the back? Yeah, so you see that whenever the rat enters this area, it's completely quiet, but whenever you enter this, this area, uh, the neuron will become active. Is this original speed or? Say again? The original speed? Yes. Okay, it goes on, but you got the idea. <laughs> this is how it looks. So um, now, so this, you know, led, of course, O'Keefe and uh, Linda, John O'Keefe and Linda Dell to formulate um, this, the, 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 the famous theory of the hippocampus as the cognitive map. Um, kind of the idea that animals have cognitive maps was uh, formulated by Tolman in the 1940s, uh, but really O'Keefe suggested there was a certain particular brain area that um, can underlie that. Uh, the, the, the original concept, by the way, of a, of a cognitive uh, map was not, by Tolman, was not even spatial. It was really going against behaviorism. Behaviorism was a psychological uh, um, a movement that uh, really looked at animals as, as stimulus response machines. You give a stimulus, you get a response. So everything is really very deterministic. 
And Tolman said, no, they have internal processing, internal representations, they have kind of, uh, uh, they can choose what to do. Um, and so the, the general, so use spatial navigation to demonstrate that, but the claim was much broader than that. The claim was really about internal representation and internal processing and uh, uh, the brain, but really it's very convenient to demonstrate things through spatial navigation because you, know, you can measure things very, very nicely. But in any case, then O'Keefe uh, and Nadell came with the idea that really it's specific to space and it's in the hippocampus based on the, the play cells. And then support for this then later came from lesion studies. Uh, I mean, there were already lesion studies before that that, that O'Keefe and Nadell used to uh, um, uh, for support of their, uh, of, of their idea, but they all had various problems because they were not purely spatial tasks. And then uh, in 82, uh, Richard Morris teamed up with O'Keefe and they did, you know, invented the Morris, what we call today the Morris water maze, where basic, which is a much better uh, uh, spatial assay for measuring you know, uh, allocentric spatial navigation. So the idea is you let her, so if you put a rat in a, in a bath like this and let, let him swim, um, they don't like it. If you put it the about the right temperature, so they're okay, they can swim, but you know, they'd like to get out if they can. And then you put a platform. And uh, so initially they have, of course, no idea that where is, or even if there, that there is a platform, so they will f uh, swim around, bump into the platform, and over uh, so some amount of trials, they'll figure out that there is a platform and they'll figure out what its position, and then they'll be, be, be able to very, uh, um, uh, in a very straight manner, no matter where you release them, they'll be able to uh, swim to the platform. So they really learn the absolute position. Um, so um, this was thought, by the way, that, this, that they really learn a kind of an allocentric representation based on distal cues. Today, very recently, in the last couple of years, this has been challenged because um, there is evidence that now that they, in fact they might use some sort of a radial representation, that what they learn is the, the, the distance from the wall they learn as compared to the walls, but then the radial position they use the cues around them. This is all kind of very ni nice behavioral studies that have been done. But there really were thousands of studies using this, uh, this approach. And the key thing is that if you, the, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this approach, is if you remove now the platform, the rat under normal conditions will swim in this quadrant, kind of exhibiting that it knows where the platform is, is supposed to be. But in hippocampal lesion animals, they cannot remember. They just kind of swim around uh, in, in randomly. Um, and these deficits in spatial memory occur after lesions in dorsal but not ventral hippocampus. Why is that interesting? Uh, we'll get to it in a second. What other evidence are there that hippocampus is uh, involved? So this is a kind of causal evidence. You lesion it, you have problems in spatial navigation. There are also a lot of correlational evidence of, of this sort. And there are really many studies showing these kinds of things. So this is uh, correlational studies showing that the volume of the hippocampus is, is related to the area that an animal navigates in. And you know, you can argue <laughs> uh, whether it's a valid uh, approach, but in any ways, in any ways uh, this is an example of this, of two very closely related voles, the meadow vole and the pine vole. Um, the, the pine vole is, uh, is monogamous, so uh, they, they form pairs. They're actually very famous uh, in social neuroscience, these <laughs> species, but for this purpose, the, the home range uh, of the male and the female are the same because they're in pair and it's a small home range for the males, whereas the metavol are polygamous and the males have a very large home range and accordingly the hippocampal volume uh, in the males is larger in the metavol than in the pine vol and there's no difference in the female. So the correlation in the hippocampal volume with, it correlates with the size of the area that the animal uh, uh, um, kind of navigates in. Of course, it's a correlation, so it could be kind of also, maybe you, you move over larger areas, so uh, uh, you, know, you need to run faster, so motor areas would, might grow. I mean, so many things can happen. This is not, of course, a proof, um, but, um, but this has been shown in, in, uh, in rodents, this is shown in, in birds, so the, the in closer rate bird species, they become larger in ones that have bigger <laughs> Uh, bigger home range. In bats, same thing, again, in within one bat family species, they have a larger home range, a bigger hippocampus. has been shown across many species. And also in humans, so um, um, <laughs> we won't have uh, Thomas Wolbers, and unfortunately, so you won't hear about human hippocampus, but I'm <laughs> going to show you now the one, <laughs> my one human hippocampus slide. 
that if you, this is the whole series of, of studies in London taxi drivers, because um, uh, London taxi drivers are expert navigators. The reason they are is that to get, it's still true to this day actually, <laughs> it actually I talked to taxi drivers <laughs> recently in London, it's still kind of the old fashioned way. To get a license as a London taxi driver, you need to learn and to, to undergo this very difficult test that actually a, small, a relatively small proportion of people pass and that you kind of in, in class like this, you have been told you're supposed to pick somebody up here and drive them to there, passing through a certain uh, 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 you know, touristic sites and you have to do it in the most straight and efficient manner possible. And you kind of, the, 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 the locations are chosen at random at each exam. So you really have to have some sort of map or a very detailed representation to be able to, to compute what's the shortest route from ab arbitrary points A to B and, and so those people who can do it <laughs> get to be taxi drivers in London and they're expert navigators and it turns out that the volume of the posterior hippocampus, which is the, 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 the homologue of the, um, the dorsal hippocampus in, 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 uh, in rats, that's where you lesion and they have the special deficits, the volume of that is larger in London taxi drivers than in age match controls it's, and it's correlated with the time spent as a taxi driver, this is kind of from one of the early studies by Eleanor McGuire, this is uh, uh, kind of normalized uh, uh, volume of the hippocampus and this is time, you know, 10 years, 20 years, so the, the ones that have spent many years as taxi drivers have a, a, bigger, a bigger hippocampus. Uh, let me just finish this slide and then I can answer. And there is, um, it's larger in taxi drivers than experience matched bus drivers, okay? Bus drivers of course have fixed routes which is more striatal, I'm not going to go into that, but we know that you know, fixed route navigation has more to do with the striatum, that's a generally an area that also is involved in, 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 in more generally in habit formation, um, whereas this flexible way of navigating, as taxi drivers need, need to do, be able to do any kind of uh, na navigation from any point A to point B, that seems to be related in the hippocampus, and in bus drivers there's no correlation with experience of hippocampal volume. Of course, with the interpretation, there's we again there's a, there, there is the hand of an egg problem. We, we we don't know if this is literally a plasticity effect that the more years that you work as a taxi driver, your hippocampus grows, or in order to survive <laughs> 20 years as a taxi driver, you'd rather have a hippocampus and kind of be very good in navigation to start with. So we don't know, but there is this correlation. Yes. Uh, I guess the bus driver is already actually answered. I, I wanted to ask if it should be answered. Ah, uh, yeah, it's a big question, yeah. So, um, there is some evidence now that maybe uh, it affects, but I, I don't think we, we, we know much about how our use of GPS might affect the system. It's actually a, a, big, uh, a big open question. But I guess it would be similar to the bus driver. <coughs> maybe, yeah, because you, yeah, you don't navigate yourself, you just follow some instructions by, by something. Yes? I, I think there might have been a study um, where they looked at the people who had cabins after they retired and they found a reduction. Yeah, yeah. okay, I didn't know I that. I don't one. know how it then compared to someone who's never been a taxi driver. Yeah. The, it does seem like there is some plasticity effect. Yeah, I think what needs to be done, I don't know what has been done, is a longitudinal study, basically. Okay. And so that's what you'd like to do, to follow several years. But I don't know that that has been done, but difficult to bring people, you know, 10 years later for scans, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just a comment. They, um, they also, I think, they, I'm not sure if it was in this particular study, but they also looked at minicab drivers, who are taxi drivers who don't do this kind of grueling test, uh, and found that they didn't have a kind of increase in... They did, did not? Did not, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, they're, so they're kind of using GPS. Mm -hmm. yeah, I see. Basically not doing the same kind of test. Yeah. So there is this kind of evidence, and of course, I had a couple of slides, but I just left this one to remind us of what Anna uh, was showing us yesterday, that uh, the only kind of causal study that um, manipulated or lesioned the hippocampus and looked at large-scale navigation as opposed to small-scale, um, um, you know, kind of Morris water maze task is this study by, uh, by Anna with the homing pigeons, so we saw that yesterday, uh, I won't go into this, but just to remind you that the, the bottom line is that really for, for clock shifted uh, uh, birds that were hippocampal lesions, they're really bad flying above the sea and doing all this sorts of crazy stuff and they were also, they were bad 
at the very last few kilometers, they could fly one kilometer from the loft and, and just miss it. So they seem to really be impaired in this landmark-based navigation uh, over relatively short, by relatively short meaning a few kilometers, that's not short, that's much bigger than a, than a, a Morris water maze, but it's still it's short compared to you know, a, a, a hundred kilometers. So this is kind of the only evidence that the hippocampus may be relevant for large-scale navigation um, over kilometers. Okay, and also to remind us uh, that, you know, so I mentioned evidence for, um, for um, spatial uh, effects in the hippocampus, but coming back to HM, there is this a big, big debate in the field whether this the hippocampus is really specific for spatial memory and spatial navigation, things like that, or whether it has a more uh, a more general uh, role because HM, for example, and other such patients have uh, you know very broad memory deficits in semantic memory and in episodic memory, um, and so there was, for example, this uh, an, a nice study a few years ago with a, a, a patients of a condition called transient global amnesia. So it's essentially, they have like a microstroke at, at various. So they have a microstroke. They kind of become a bit uh, disoriented or. Kind of forget things, not clear it's, uh, what's going on, so they are, uh, uh, you know, they go to the hospital and then, you know, you can scan them and find that they have a, a certain uh, uh, focus, really a focal position in the hippocampus, these are the two hippocampi, uh, focal position of, of a microstroke. This usually goes away after a few days, it's not a permanent thing, but during that time, what these people did is, is study them, and so they did a virtual Morris water maze task. Essentially, they had to navigate in this virtual reality, kind of on a laptop, um, doing an analog of the Morris water maze. And the, the control people had, again, showed that after, uh, in those probe trials, when the, the, uh, the platform was, was removed, they were doing st going straight without a problem, whereas the patient really went all over the place. They had no idea. So it's, it's, very similar to how a rat uh, uh, with hippocampal lesions look like. But on the other hand, they have also other memory problems. It's not so, it's very clearly they have a spatial problem, these patients. They're really, this is focal to the hippocampus. Unlike a lot of the, for example, the, um, the HM, he had lesion in the internal cortex, in most of the hippocampus, but also in the amygdala. I mean, it was really lesions in humans or, or uh, uh, is, is usually very messy, it's hard to interpret it because it it's usually covers several areas, whereas here it's very, very focal, so they have a spatial deficit, but also uh, they have other memory deficits. So this whole thing about spatial memory and navigation versus general, uh, generally memory is under debate to this day, uh, for you to be aware. Okay, so let me now uh, move to the, after kind of giving you this quick uh, uh, historical overview of the evidence for involvement of hippocampus in, in navigation, let's move now to the various spatial cell types that were discovered. So let's start with place cells, and one interesting uh, um, uh, study that I want to show you is that was uh, from the Mosel lab, uh, where they looked at uh, place fields in CA3, and the, so th again, the hippocampus is this long sausage, so this is the, uh, the dorsal part, this will be the ventral part, and what they found is that this area, the more dorsal part, uh, contained relatively small place fields, whereas the more ventral part contained much larger place field. And um, you'll also note, by the way, that whenever the animal is running right to left, on this, this is just a linear track, 18 meter linear track, the, the firing of the neuron is different than when it's uh, uh, running uh, left to right. So this neuron, for example, does not uh, fire at all on this direction, but fires in this direction. Same this neuron. Uh, this neuron does fire in both directions, but the, the place field is somewhat shifted. And this, th this we know for many years. Uh, when you, on a linear track, when you run in one direction versus the other direction, uh, the maps, the hippocampal maps, maps look different. And they sampled throughout many regions along this, uh, this kind of hippocampal, long, what's called the longitudinal axis of this uh, sausage, and they found this, in general, this uh, a correlation of the sizes of place fields, and these, these three lines are three different measures of a size of a place field. You can calculate it different ways, but you see that the trend is really not dependent on exactly how you calculate these things. And this is the position within the sausage, zero meaning this end and 100% meaning the very ventral end. So this kind of re relative position within the hippocampus and you see this, 
uh, increase. Well, people have done, uh, have found similar things even before that study, but this study really looked in very uh, detail along the entire uh, longitudinal axis for most of it. And the reason, uh, again, I want to mention this is that the fact that this is the, so here we have small place fields, here we have very large place fields, and the fact that here, um, this is the place where lesions in the Morris water maze affect navigation, whereas here they don't affect much. And the interpretation is that, uh, you know, here you have small place fields, so they will be relevant for small scale navigation over this two meter uh, uh, bath. <laughs> Uh, whereas here the place fields are so large, several meters, that they're kind of beyond the relevant resolution for doing a Morris water maze task. So this will be the normal um, interpretation. Um, an alternative interpretation, and we'll get to this uh, later, is that the fact that you have lesi that lesions in this area uh, create deficits could also be because, uh, at least in the bats, we found neurons that are uh, 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 encoding goal direction to the uh, to uh, this uh, spatial goal. So this is of course a goal directed orient uh, goal directed task. Uh, the Morris water maze. So the fact that you lesion an area doesn't mean that the play cells there are responsible. Could be other cell types in this area that are responsible. So in particular, could be that the goal direction cells uh, are involved. But we'll get to this in the, in, in the second talk in more detail. Um, so if you record place uh, fields of, uh, of uh, it, uh, place cells simultaneously. So this is an example from the O'Keefe lab. Many neurons, some 30 something neurons recorded simultaneously. Um, <coughs> and you can see that they, their place fields tile the environment. So uh, this just, you know, if you put a bunch of tetrods in the hippocampus and you record uh, a random selection of cells there, but you see that they tile the environment. And this, uh, here, the, 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 the pa each panel is a different neuron. So there's one neuron, another neuron, a third neuron. And they were ordered such that in the top left corner of this plot, uh, there's the, a neuron that has a field in the you know, top left uh, northwest uh, part of the arena. And here it's a, it's a southeast part of the arena. But just by looking at it, you see that the, the place fields really tile the environment. So this really then allows you to represent the position of the animal no matter where it is. Um, so it's kind of a re relatively random tiling. Maybe there's some more place fields around the, the borders, but in general, th there are place fields everywhere. And then, given that that's a situation, then if you record many neurons simultaneously, then you can decode the position of the animal. So this is uh, from a, a paper by Wilson and McNaughton where they recorded, in this case, 18 neurons simultaneously. Um, and this was the original paper where, kind of, they, for this, they, uh, they invented the, the tetrodes par in parallel in the same year, also in the O'Keeffe lab. They invented the tetrodes, so now you can record ma many neurons simultaneously, 80 in this case. So some neurons you see seem to fire all over the place. These are interneurons. They, in fact, although they fire all over the place, it turns out that they do carry spatial information. The fact that you don't have a Gaussian place field that's very precise in space, but you see some modulation. Let's say this have one fires a little bit more in the center than elsewhere. It turns to be very reproducible and reliable. So they also carry spatial information, the interneurons, but you know, they, by and large, they tend to be ignored, but they are also spatial. But in any case, if you look at the pyramidal neurons, which are these ones, you'll see that some of them don't fire, and this is generally true that not all neurons are place cells in a given environment, but those that do fire, if you uh, use them to decode the position of the animal, then you can do pretty well. So here, I don't, rem don't even remember which one is which. I guess the, the red is probably the track of the animal and the black is the decoded position or vice versa, I don't remember which one. Um, and the, what they showed, and this has been shown many times since, that um, if you now look at the decoding error versus the number of neurons, so if they use all 80 neurons and they use these various lines or various parameters of the, of the decoder, the details are not so important, then the best decoder with 80 neurons gets to a, a tracking accuracy that's about seven centimeters or eight centimeters, it's just a little bit, uh, a little bit worse than the, the actual, the, the tracking accuracy that they had in the experiment. So, so probably with 100 neurons or 150 neurons, you, you can get as, as, as good as, the, as your tracking accuracy. So, and of course, for less neurons, you are less good. So this really, you can re re decode the position of the animal pretty precisely if you have enough cells recorded simultaneously. <coughs> yes. Are behaviorally, behaviorally relevant um, 
uh, positions more represent a fair place cells. So, for example, if you have this water maze experiment, yeah. that form more. Yes. More so this has been done uh, for in the again in the Mosul lab. They had uh, an annular. It hasn't been done much because to do uh, actual uh, uh, electrophysiological recording in a in a water maze where water are splashed, you know, water and electronics are, are a bad mixture in general. But they have done this experiment, uh, and I have two papers on this. It's quite a heroic experiment. But uh, so they did not they did an annular water maze. So it's not a, f a f you know open field arena, but the animal swims around. And then when it gets to the platform, it can rest. And then indeed there was there were more place fields, uh, about double the, 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 the number of, place of, of neurons with place cells at that location as opposed to everywhere else. So there is generally an overrepresentation of, uh, of important locations. Is there a generalized spatial topic arrangement of place cells or is it completely random? Is it so, so again? Um, is there a generalized spatial topic representation of place cells or is it gen is just random? Spatial topic meaning like, in like the brain, like nearby neurons? Yeah, I think those are nearby places. No. So as far as we can tell, the answer is no. This has been done both with tetrodes and with imaging. Uh, with, you know, with these virtual realities with two-fold imaging, there seem to be really absolutely no relation. So uh, uh, nearby, you know, two cells that are really close by can have far away uh, fields and vice versa. I mean, there's maybe if you look at the imaging data, there's maybe a little bit of a trend, but really, generally, it's very different than sensory cortices in this, where, where nearby neurons tend to do the similar things. Here, uh, they do different things, which actually, by the way, helps to record large numbers of cells because for spice sorting is great because the nearby neurons really do different things, so <laughs> they don't interfere with each other, so you can record many more neurons this way. Yes? So, kind of similar question, <coughs> um, what about neurons that encode nearby spaces in like a new environment that they tend to? N no, so I'll get to this, but when you go to a new environment and there's remapping, I'll get to this phenomenon of re remapping in a moment, in the hippocampus when you move to a completely different room, completely new environment, generally what would happen is that there will be uh, remapping cells, would, I mean, there will be a new map, meaning this place field of a neuron could move there or it can stop firing or stop fir start firing. In general, there is no topolo topological mapping, meaning two cells that had a place field nearby in one environment can have, can have a place field far away in another. So it's really kind of reshuffling, creating a new map that seems to be randomly related to the old one. It's different in the internal cortex. There, that's something that's very systematic, but we'll get to that. How does the brain then figure out if it's so random? Like, it seems not very easy to understand then how the brain figures out. Now you go to a new, you need to newly wire everything. Uh, well, it's a good, it's a very good question. You need to know something about the representation, right? To, to, to be able to decode, you need to know essentially the underlying structure. So I agree with you. This is why some people think that maybe, you know, the hippocampus is more for associating space with objects and with position, all sorts of learning, spatial learning, whereas really for representing space you need something more stable like the grid cells. So we'll get to that. But in general, if you do, if somehow in, uh, the downstream area knew what were the representation, what is the hippocampal representation, then you can decode. But this is the big if, because we really don't know how it's used. We'll get one of the points, kind of at the very end, I'll have a, kind of a list of open questions, but one of the, I think, big open questions is that we don't know really how everything fits together. I'll, I'll, I'll go through now a taxonomy of neurons, right? Place cells, grid cells, heterection cells, but now how is all there, they're all wired to really create navigation. We really have very little understanding. So this is one of the things, so the who is the decoder and how is it decoded in the brain. I mean, we can do it, of course, in the computer, but how is the brain doing that? That we really know very little. So this possibly sort of underscores the <coughs> thing we mentioned yesterday, that um, cognitive maps need not necessarily be represented by a, a, a map-like spatial structure in the brain. So if that, if that randomness is part of that, sort of inability to make that connection. Um, well, I mean, I'm not sure that the fact that there is remapping between different environments necessarily speaks against a map-like representation. I mean, you could have a map-like... Uh, the brain, of course, would like to reuse resources, right? You don't want to have, for every one of the hundreds of rooms you've ever been in, you don't want to have a subpopulation of neurons specific to each one of them. You want to reuse your neurons. I mean, it does make sense to reuse the neurons and reshuffle things. 
And in, in fact, the, and the fact that there is this remapping, this also means that there is identity coding for the rooms, right? This, this, these neurons not only represent faithfully where the animal is in the environment, they also encode which of the environments uh, are you. There was a paper uh, from the Mosel lab called, you know, 11 uh, maps in 11 rooms. This was the title of the paper, <laughs> where they literally moved and record the same cells in 11 different rooms. It's a big lab, they have 11 rooms. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and generally, there was absolutely random relation between the, the different maps. And you know, you can probably go to more. I mean, it's practically, <laughs> you cannot hold neurons for so long. But you, you, in capacity-wise, you can probably represent hundreds of environments this way. So it's actually not a bad way to represent many different environments. Especially, you know, for an animal like a rat, it has these many subterranean structures, and maybe each one of them have a different map. I mean, it's one of the things we don't know, but it, it does make sense to have this big capacity. Yes? Just to, just to, to be short, um, so if you move to 11 rooms and come back to room number one, it's the same place? Oh, yeah, it's stable. Okay, I didn't mention that. Very good point. I, the maps tend to be stable, yes. So if you look in rats at least, and also in bats, if you look at the, it's a bit less stable in mice, but in rats and bats at least, if you look at a map or at a place field of a neuron recorded in, in an environment and then recorded later in the same environment, it's actually very stable. Correlation coefficient, if you just, just do a correlation coefficient of the two maps, you know, in these two repeat trials, correlation coefficients could be an average, you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.75, something like this, which is pretty good. So they are, the maps are stable. Which is obviously tied into memory too, because I could go back to the house where yeah. I grew up yeah. as a child, yeah. even though I haven't been there for 30 years, yeah. and I could still find my way through that house. Yeah, well, so there is another thing which I don't have time to go to, is uh, 30 years, nobody recorded the same neuron in a rat for 30 years, obviously, but <laughs> you can do that. But uh, um, at some point, and there is a debate about that memory becomes the hippocampus is thought to be important for you know, uh, encoding memory, but at some point it becomes hippocampal independent. So HM, for example, he did remember things from his childhood. He could not learn new things, but he did remember things from his early childhood. And similarly with other, uh, with other uh, uh, patients, also in rats, people have, there's a lot of studies looking at that. And there's a debate about how long is this wi time window over which things, memories become hippocampal independent. But the general I would say it's a consensus in the field that the hippocampus is not where the memories are stored long term. They are being transferred to the neocortex for storage. How fast does it take? There's a big debate about that. <laughs> but, but the ultimate result is that the, the memories themselves are stored elsewhere. So the hippocampus is really more the, of the encoder. Yes? Is there anything known about the stability of a learned map in terms of like how long you had to be exposed to an environment to have this stable in return? Or Okay, so these are two different questions. With cues and richness of the environment, there has been very few studies. There's one study from uh, McNaughton who looked, they had a linear track and one half of it was kind of empty, no, nothing there, and the other half of it was uh, a lot of stuff there, a lot of kind of objects and odors and really rich in information of all sorts visual, factory, tactile, and they found that the place fields and that half of the track were a bit smaller and also more stable. So it def definitely helps. But you know, not many uh, studies. Now in terms of how time it takes, if you put an animal into a new environment, then s sometimes what, what, uh, what the people see is that initially a neuron might not fire, but then at some point it will suddenly start to fire, and then usually the place field remains there. It might sharpen a little bit, so in you know, the very first, let's say if it's a linear track, the very first time so the animal might pass a couple of times through the, this position, no firing at all, then it will pass the third or fourth time and it suddenly a firing will appear, it might be a bit broad, and then over the next firing it will narrow and remain. And the, I, mean, I don't have time to go into, but uh, there was very interesting, actually, <laughs> um, questions uh, mechanistically how you can get something like that because how you can get plasticity that is not related on previous activity. It's certainly non habian but well, we can talk, can talk about this uh, later. Um, okay, place cells are not just in rodents. So far I showed you in rodents, but also in other, other species. We, in, in my postdoc I found uh, place cells in bats, in big brown bats in this case. So you see some examples of place fields from big brown bats. This is from our uh, current study species, the Egyptian fruit bat, also place fields at tile space, so it's not just a rodent thing. Uh, 
Uh, I'll talk more about bats later, as I said. We also found place fields in 3D. You let a bat uh, fly in a three-dimensional room, five by six meters. You found neurons that are representing 3D space. So generally, this phenomena of place cells is not, is not unique to rodents. Um, well, again, I said I'll talk about bats uh, later. It also, there seem to be uh, place cells or place cell-like activity in humans. So this is um, from the original um, study that showed that in 2003. So this is, uh, I told you about HM, about this uh, crazy surgery for removing the two hippocampi. Seems crazy, but actually they're doing the same surgery to this day. The only difference is that they do not remove on hippocampus on both sides. They remove one. Turns out then the people are fine. But you ideally will not want to remove, so if you have an epilepsy patient with intractable epilepsy uh, on one side only, then you know, people still do the surgery of resection, surgical resection, and you want to remove as small as a part of the hippocampus as possible. So in order to know exactly where is the focus of the epilepsy, what, you, what the neurosurgeons do, they insert electrodes into the brains of these patients in order to map exactly the, the locus of the epilepsy so you can later remove that small part as precisely as possible. So then you have a patient sitting in the hospital with electrodes in the brain, sometimes for a few days or a week, basically waiting for a large you know, uh, uh, epilepsy event. Uh, because literally when that happens, they just they take out the, uh, the electrodes and go in with the knife. I mean, this is literally how it works. So, you can then, if the uh, patient agrees, test them with all sorts of tasks, right? They have electrodes in the brain. So, uh, so this was one of these studies. A look at that um, with kind of virtual reality type of navigation, where they had to navigate in this small virtual town, uh, go to this shop, to that shop, and then they found neurons. I mean, this is an example of a cell that had this color. It's again the firing rate. This neuron fired in this. Um, location and not so much in other locations. See, the coverage is really bad. They never, this patient never got to this gray areas. And, and there were other uh, kind of critiques of this study. But anyway, this was an evidence was something that looks like, you know, place cell-like. Then later, uh, there was, for example, there were several more studies of this type. This is another study later on uh, that, in this case, they were just rotating either clockwise or counterclockwise in this virtual arena and found neurons that would were active, in, again, this is in the hippocampus, were active in a particular location when going you know, clockwise, but not counterclockwise. So this you know, is more similar to the way we typically do experiments in humans. So there is evidence for place cells in humans as well. Yes? Uh, I always thought that it's crucial that, that animals have to, to locomote to, to find <laughs> nice places. But yeah. here it's completely virtual. So you are very correct. This whole thing of virtual reality is actually quite a big debate in the field because it turns out that the detail of how you do the virtual reality can affect a lot the activity of the neuron. So, it's, for example, uh, a year ago or so, there were two studies that seem to do seem to have done a very similar uh, um, seem to have had a very similar design. One from David Tang's lab, another one from uh, from Mayan Kmeta's lab. In David Tang's lab, they found beautiful place cells and grid cells, and in Mayan Kmeta, it was just a mess. No, no spatial selectivity uh, at all. And the difference between the two, uh, the two experiments was really relatively minor. I mean, if you think about it in advance, you would not expect such a dramatic difference. The difference was that in David Tank's experiment, the animals were more, it was kind of a body restraint, so they were more free to move their, their body and, and, and head. And then they got the normal spatial selectivity, whereas in Mayank Meadows, they were a bit more restricted. Still, they were able to move their head, but not as much. They were not head fixed in this case. So, uh, so what seems to be a relatively minor difference in how much an animal can actually locomote makes a, a big difference. So these typical, typically these virtual reality studies in animals are done on, on one-dimensional uh, tracks. It's really difficult, except the very f uh, one study where you, the animal doesn't even turn. It really goes kind of one unidirectional. I'm not talking about the animal studies, yeah. The animal goes unidirectional, is virtually teleported back, goes one direction. Then you do find you know, play cells in this, you know, in this virtual environment, neurons responding to this virtual environment, but it is uh, quite a big debate of, of how much that, because you don't, if an animal is head fixed, most of the experiments, the animal is head fixed, you, know, you do imaging or you do uh, electrophysiology and the animal is head fixed, you don't have normal vestibular inputs, <coughs> you, have the only, you have a mismatch between the visual and vestibular inputs, so a lot of problems. And so I, I'd say, I mean, my personal take on it is the more naturalistic you do it, so the more of the, 
visual um, of the various multicenter cues you allow to be intact, the more normal things look. So you can still have an animal, let's say, look, the nice thing about virtual reality is that you can really allow you to control completely the inputs, which is really very difficult or impossible in real world situations. But you can still have an animal locomoting freely and still kind of do all sorts of uh, funky manipulations on the world, rotate the world and things like that. Very useful, yeah, but you have to remember that, that if you deprive some of the cues, then in some cases things, things look uh, weird, yeah. What's the reason that they do only this virtual reality? It would be quite easy to make a human walk. Uh, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy primarily for, uh, for regulatory reasons. It's a hospital, there are patients, you know, so, so the doctors are really afraid, you know, if you, I, you know, if they sit in the bed connected with the cables, the electrophysiology, I mean, that's how it looks. They have a big bundle of cables to an electrophysiology system. Uh, why is that oh, not wireless, like for your system? Uh, yeah, well, people are starting to go in this direction. So actually even not, so A, people are starting to go in this direction wirelessly, but even not wireless. You can have a patient, you know, having it connected to a, you know, to a cart like this and start walking around with an electrophysiology system. So they've started doing recordings like that already. Um, not so much with single cells, but with LFP. But I think, I agree with you. I mean, I think this needs to be done, but usually the surgeons are kind of, you know, if something <laughs> goes wrong, disconnected, I mean, so you, sometimes you don't want to deal with these things, yeah? But so, so it's more mainly these reasons, reasons and not the technical reasons that are the limiting factor here. Um, yeah. Uh, for mice, do people do any virtual realities where it's not a visual virtual reality, but maybe in the tactile, which you some whiskers, or maybe other or at least? Uh, pff, yeah, I think I've seen people are starting to do that, yeah. And, you know, you can get with purely odor, for example, uh, inputs, you can get a representation of space. I mean, if you have always, you know, have a lemon odor here and vanilla odor there, et cetera, et cetera, it's, space, it's, it's mapped to space, then you'll get place cell activity, even in complete darkness. And are those um, place cells somewhat different in size versus visual ones? Uh, I don't remember. Okay. Uh, so place fields, if you rotate the world, basically if you have an animal in the cylinder, in this case, it's cylinder with high walls and a big white cue card, which is here, kind of a 90 degree cue card. So really very prominent cue card, and you rotate the world, rotate the cylinder, then place field typically will ro rotate uh, with them, uh, and you rotate it back, uh, the place field will rot rotate back, so really, I mean, I think it's, 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 there's nothing really surprising here. You rotate the most prominent thing, you basically rotate the world, then everything rotates with it, so this kind of makes sense. And this shows about the question of stability, that the place field, again, is relatively, relatively stable, you know, in the repeat, uh, repeat session, yeah. Just, uh, I think I remember this paper. Um, they did like, in the end, long-term navigation, right? So the, the animal is kind of, knows very well the environment, it's really familiar, and then they turn the cue and then the remapping takes a while, or do you remember if there's some kind of time course of the remapping? Um. And the, when, you, when you rotate. So which paper you refer to? This one. Um, Usually, so there is a measurement problem. The, the, the usual way that you do this, if you look at single neurons, is that in order to sample space, once you rotate the thing, then in order to have enough trajectory of the animal covering space should take at least a few tens of seconds. So your basic limitation while looking at single cells is, is that. Is, is how much is the sampling issue. So you really cannot say much beyond time scales of a few tens of seconds. However, people have looked at population recordings and then you can uh, very quickly see switches. So let's say the, 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 the Moses had this study by uh, Karel Jezek where they kind of had, it's not this experiment, but they changed very suddenly the environment. They had these LEDs where, where kind of one pattern of light and then suddenly another pattern of light came up. So it's kind of a virtual teleportation to another world of sorts. And then uh, the, uh, th by looking at many neurons simultaneously, the kind of the representation change in almost instantaneously to the other map. It also some t uh, in some cases kind of flickered back and forth as if the animal wasn't still sure if it's in this world or the other world, but, but then it can happen very fast. But you need to do population recordings to answer this kind of question. Would you consider this as a, sorry, I'm sorry. 
would you consider it as a remapping as well? No, no. Uh, remapping, I'll get to in a second, because this is usually not considered, I mean, it's a matter of terminology, but you, here you just rotate the world. So remapping usually is referred to when you change something in a more dramatic way. But this is really terminology. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that, because as I remember the study, you remove the animal from the box, and then you do the rotation without yeah. animal knowing. So actually, you don't actually have a remapping. The animal takes it in the same that he thinks everything is the same. Ah, okay. So the, so animal, the animal has is the same view. The thing yeah. is that the place just rotates in the box because the animal thinks that yeah. it's the same place. So it's right. not the remapping, it's mm -hmm. just, just that the place is, is, an <coughs> is anchored to the external man. Okay. Um, Place fields are also affected by manipulations in environmental geometry. This is from the O'Keefe uh, lab. If you had rat run in this square box, but then you had these planks that you can move out and then create environments that are either elongated in this direction, or that direction, or just larger environments, then place fields tend to uh, increase uh, in size in the larger environment. Uh, this is another example. They can get more elongated in this elongated environment. So there's definitely the geometry of the environment affect the, the place cells and it's really, uh, there is a, a, a big um, stream in the field, I would say, that, that really uh, f uh, suggests that, uh, that uh, the geometry is the predominant uh, uh, determinant of these place cells. So then by manipulating geometry, you can change place cells. Um, now, place cells, yeah. Sorry, uh, okay, so geometry can uh, change the shape of place fields. But what about the properties of the space? Because you showed that uh, in Bath you have a very uh, you have spheres that are place fields. Yeah. And then I was wondering whether you would expect something different if the space is not isotropic anymore. For example, if you place uh, an obstacle, yeah. or if you I don't know you have a cube and the body's uh, flying there and you have yeah. a fan in a way that is not the same flying in one direction. Yeah. Anymore. So, well, I haven't shown you <laughs> the study, but anyway, I'm going to answer. We actually did that. In our, uh, the, for the 3D place cells, we had them fly either in this room that's really non-isotropic in the sense that it's five by six meters, but it's not five meters in height. Yeah, it was, it's 2.7 meters in height, so it's non-isotropic. But we also recorded them in a cubic environment that's, that's 2.7 by 2.7 by 2.7. And place fields, in, in our case, were actually isotropic in all cases. So, but, you know, they were exposed to the environment. So, I mean, I think it really depends on the details of how you do the experiment. Um, if we are in a linear track, in both bats, of course, and in, in rats, then place fields are elongated. You know, the linear track can be 10 centimeter wide, and you know, the place field can be tens or centime of centimeter or 80 centimeter long. So, of course, you know, the, you can't even map across, right? So, okay, so this is just to show you that the, uh, I've told you about kind of visual manipulations where you manipulate. The, the visual environment, or you move planks, these are mostly visual, but although you can say also tactile, they go and, and, and touch the walls, but you can, in an experiment where you turn the light, the, uh, turn the light uh, uh, off and then turn it uh, on back, um, the, uh, the place fields uh, oftentimes remain uh, stable, and this is sometimes interpreted as evidence for, what, uh, for path integration, which is kind of independent of, of the visual input, I personally think that this is evidence for the fact that we were using olfaction here because in another study in 2000 uh, here, this study from the group in Marseille uh, by Savetal, uh, they showed that when you turn off the light and you wipe out the odors, then the place cells disappear. Only 10% of the, of the place cells remained uh, with the spatial tuning. So really, um, uh, these neurons seem to be multi, multimodal. They have visual information coming out of factory, and if you get rid of all visual, of all sensor information, then just think, uh, things collapse. Uh, you have multiple maps that are stored simultaneously in the, uh, in the rat hippocampus. So this is an example of a study uh, from the O'Keefe lab where they had uh, uh, animals move from one environment, a square environment, to a circular environment, and again, square, circle, square, circle, and, you know, let's look at, uh, at this neuron, for example. So in a square environment, it has a place field here, and again here, and again here, and the circular environment, it has a place field on the south side. So, so you really see that, you know, when you switch the animal between different environments, the place fields switch in a reproducible manner. Some neurons, let's say, turn off. This neuron is active only in the square uh, 
and not in the circle, etc. So, but, but by just looking, these are simultaneously recorded neurons, you can see uh, that there is a representation of, in this case, two environments, but as, as I said, it can go up to 11. That's at least the current uh, record. Yes? Is A, A, C, and E the same room there? Or is it just the same? I say I don't remember. I think it was, but I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember. Now here, they did something very, here I can answer your, your question, because here I remember the details. This was a very interesting study where they produced evidence for a kind of a phase transition. So here what they did is they trained initially animals in two different rooms. So they had animals run in a square box in one room and in a circular box in another room for a relatively, relatively long time. So they learned that, you know, square is completely one environment, circle is completely another environment, another room. Then, in one room, they started morphing or manipulating the shapes so they will be, you know, from perfect squares to kind of square-like and all the way to kind of circle-like and all the way to the circle, okay? A whole series of positions. And they did it randomly. This is plotted, ordered by the squareness or the circleness of the shape, but in fact they did it randomly. But this was after the animals already learned that square is you know, one world and, 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 uh, and circle is a completely different world in you know, a different room. And what you see here is something really dramatic, that at a particular point, these are all simultaneously, 20 simultaneously recorded neurons, at a particular you know, squareness, <laughs> uh, all neurons simultaneously change their firing. So you see these neurons are completely not active in the square environment, suddenly boom, they're firing in the, in, the, in the circular ones. These neurons, vice versa, they're active in the square, become inactive in the circular, and these neurons change their activity. I like this neuron number 13 because it shows some persistence. Yeah, you have a place field here in the square, then it switches to this another position, but you also have a remnant of, of the old field. So there's some interesting hysteresis effects. But in general, it's really all the neurons seem to, it at this point, shift, or almost all the neurons shift their tuning. There are some that retain, like this one. But generally, this seem to be, and this is, again, shows that you have, you know, different maps, but it also shows that uh, it was kind of suggested an evidence for attractor dynamics, this kind of uh, uh, sudden uh, jump to a different map. It a very, given a very small shift in the, in the input, uh, is suggestive of attractor dynamics. Okay, another uh, point that's uh, uh, kind of studied a lot with respect to place cells is that they have, so all I told you so far is kind of a rate coding, right? The firing rate of a neuron says something about where you are in space, but there's also temporal coding. And in particular, there's this phenomena called theta phase precession, whereby, um, um, so if you record from the hippocampus of rodents, you see this very clear oscillation at about eight hertz, a theta oscillation, and then you can record spikes uh, so, you know, this is a, 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 from a rat running on a linear track, this is its place field, but when you look kind of inside the place field uh, and look at particular, uh, these are kind of zero crossings of the, of the, of the LFP here, the, the gray, and you'll see that the neuron initially fired at a particular phase relative to this zero crossing, relative to the LFP, but it starts to fire earlier and earlier as the animal moves through the place field. So if you plot then, um, the phase of the spikes relative to this oscillation versus the position within the place field, you have this kind of correlation. So basically, if you look at that, then this timing information of spikes relative to the LFP tells you something about the position of the animal. You have information about the position that has nothing to do with firing rate, but with temporal coding. So this is a, an example of a temporal code that's kind of coexisting with a more standard rate code, which is the place field, where the firing rate of the neuron encodes the position. So you have these two codes going on simultaneously, and people have shown that if you combine them together, you can in fact decode the position of the animal more precisely. I mean, this is pretty trivial, yeah, if you have the information, obviously it will work, but people have actually shown that it does work. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we don't have, we don't have uh, uh, the state oscillation in bats, so this kind of argues against this idea, although in a, in a weird way we do find uh, this is an unpublished result where you do find phase precession in the absence of an oscillation. But this is a bit of a detail that I might or might not uh, get to in the second talk. All right, another, another uh, interesting uh, property of place cells that you need to know is that they don't just represent, you know, the online current position of where I am. 
but they're also involved in, um, in non-local uh, phenomena. So for example, there is uh, this phenomena called, uh, and it has various names, it's pretty confusing, and, and uh, David Foster will talk a lot about this, so I really am showing just a couple of slides about this, so his entire talk will be devoted to what you can get from population activity in the hippocampus. But anyway, I'll show a couple of slides. So if you have, if you're recording, you know, 30 neurons simultaneously in the hippocampus, and this is now time, the animal is running, and you, the, you order the neurons by the position of their place field. So as the animal runs al uh, along the track, first fires the first neuron, then the second, then the third, then the fourth. So you, you order them this way, right? You order them such that they will be uh, uh, according to the position of the place fields. But then you look one, while the animal is resting at the end of the track, right here, you see that suddenly all these neurons fire together. But in fact, it's not together. You look at more zoom in, you see that they're firing in a structure that's kind of uh, uh, um, really resembling very much the order of activation uh, while the animal is behaving. It could be in the same order, it could be reverse, we'll, we won't go into the, the, these details now, but this seems to be really um, a, uh, a, a non-local activity. The animal is not going anywhere, it's stationary right here. It's eating its food, food pellet or just doing nothing, but suddenly there is this non-local activation. Non-local meaning place cells that represent other positions than where you are now are suddenly activated. And this has been um, kind of two kinds of interpretations for this. Uh, and I'm sure that David Foster will talk about this. One is of memory consolidation. That this is kind of related to the past, to where I've been, representing where I've been, but also maybe to planning. An animal that moves in the linear track back and forth, it's really hard to dissociate the two because, you know, where you've come from and where you're going <laughs> is kind of the same thing, so it's hard to dissociate. People have done other experiments, you can dissociate them better, but it seems to be that there are, both of these situations occur, where you have both replay of what happened before, but maybe also planning of what's, what's going to happen. Now, this, this replay of what just happened is related to this whole uh, theory of what's called sometimes systems consolidation. As I mentioned, the memories are not stored in the hippocampus. They are, um, they are stored elsewhere, and a dominant theory in the field is that these kind of uh, population bursts of activity are kind of information packets that are being sent to, to the neocortex for, for, for storage, if you will. And in fact, we know that, you know, these these uh, activities, this population activity, occur usually very often in conjunction with these what's called high frequency ripples, so these high frequency oscillations that we know that synchronous to them, there's also activity occurring in, let's say, prefrontal cortex. So there's, the people have done recordings in hippocampus and, and cortex simultaneously, showing that there is, you know, as these, this packet of activity occurs in the hippocampus, then there's also, let's say, transition to upstate in new cortex. So there's evidence, uh, again, it's kind of correlational, but there is evidence that suggests that it's, uh, it's uh, uh, just let me uh, finish this slide, that there is uh, indeed, uh, uh, it, it's important for memory. And there's also causal um, uh, evidence. So for example, this is a study from uh, Lauren Frank's lab. There se were several studies like this. This is uh, one I like in particular, where what they did is that they've, in real time, so they asked, is this really these packets of information that are correlated to this this ripple, this ripple event are important for memory. Um, so what they did is they in real time, they had this electronic circle that in real time identified that this thing is starting now and then they could zap the hippocampus. Not exactly the hippocampus, they zapped the uh, hippocampal commissure, but anyway, they zapped, uh, um, they could kind of shut down very transient the hippocampal activity. And then, so here you see, you know, they identify the start, just the installation kind of starts here, they zap it, it kind of disappears. And as a control, they did the same thing, but they zapped the hippocampus 200 milliseconds later. So it's kind of will be the same number of zappings, but not shutting off this population activity. And what they found is that then these rats were really impaired in a spatial working memory. It's a very simple task. We were running on this W maze. They're kind of, the task was to do like that and go back and go back and like that. But so when you're here, there's really no memory involved. You only really need to go south. That's, that's trivial. But when you're here, your choice, whether you go left or right, really depends on where you came from. If you came from here, then you need to go there. If you came from there, you need to go here. 
And here, when you do this manipulation, you zap the hippocampus, they're very impaired. Okay, so there is kind of also causal evidence that, that it's related to, to memory, which is to working spatial memory, spatial working memory. Okay, and lastly, to show you the evidence that exists for planning, not just for representing the past or memory, but also representing the future in the hippocampus. This is from a study by David Foster. I'm sure he'll show you more of these things. But here, they had a task where the rat was running um, and visiting, uh, you know, basically they had a fixed, it's kind of a cheese board maze with many, wall, many uh, wells, and there is always one, one fixed uh, well where well, there's always food in there, or not always, but there's food in a constant position, then a random well. So basically the rat has to go fetch the food here, which is in a fixed location per day, then go and search randomly until it finds the other well, and then go again to the fixed well and then search randomly. And then, so it's kind of a nice task because it alternates a, a goal-directed phase where you go, go to a goal which you know, and this random search when you go to a goal where you don't know where it will happen. And then what you found is these, is these uh, sequences of activity. So first of all, as the animal is, is, is running around, so this is the animal running around, and the, the yellow blob is kind of the decoder performance showing it, it tracks very nicely the activity. Uh, maybe I should uh, stop that. They, what they did is recorded about 200 neurons simultaneously with the gazillion neurons, 40, uh, gazillion tetrads, 40 tetrads, 20 in each hippocampus. It's really a lot of tetrads in there, so we can record 200 or so neurons simultaneously. And then um, they can decode the position of the animal, but they can also use the same decoder, so the, the same information based on the place cells while the animal is not going anywhere to see is there like planning trajectories e expressed. Okay, so again, when the animal is running around, the, the decoder uh, follows very faithfully the position of the animal. So the decoder is this red blob uh, or yellowish blob. It follows the position of the rat. But then when the rat is actually stationary at this point and it's going to go here, you see that there are these de trajectory events there are these non-local population events where, uh, where the, uh, uh, the decoder goes to the actual goal, and then the animal goes to that goal. <laughs> so, um, uh, okay, okay, here it now goes to the actual goal. Where the, so it's kind of, there's this planning going on possibly, uh, and then the animal will go there. So this is kind of evidence for, for also uh, planning and not just representing the past. Yes? No? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so those are the same place cells that fire when the animal goes to the actual location as well? Yeah, it's the same place cells. Basically, the way you do the decoder is you, your decoder works on the place fields based on the animal's behavior, right? So you, whenever the animal is here, there are place fields that fire here. When the animal is here, there are places that fire. So ba basically, now when I'm standing here, I'm not going anywhere. If the neuron that's firing when I'm supposed to be there will fire, and then the neuron that's there, and then the neuron that's there, then the decoder will create these trajectory events, yes. But the decoder is based on the place fields as measured during the behavior. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, people think that these sharp wave ripples uh, are associated with some sleeping states, and therefore yeah. regarding free play, I'm wondering, when I'm planning to do yeah, something, yeah. I don't sleep. Yeah, yeah, so okay, so I, I, I know, yeah, I didn't go into the, you're right that uh, it, they occur both during, uh, during sleep and then it's actually thought to be related to uh, uh, kind of transfer of information uh, to neocortex, but also during behavior and then it's thought to be related to kind of ongoing uh, uh, spatial you know, working memory performance or maybe planning. So these kind of past versus future outlooks. There are also studies in humans suggesting that the hippocampus is involved both in kind of past and in future. It's kind of interesting, a memory structure that represents both the past and the future. I think it's a, there's an interesting link there, but uh, there's evidence for both, both of these things. Okay, I think I need to uh, you know, hit the gas. <laughs> Let's talk uh, uh, also about uh, some other cells. So heterection cells, uh, these are just some uh, historical examples from, uh, of heterection cells. So these are neurons that are found in, in air burning areas surrounding the hippocampus. And here you see three examples of head erection cells. So these are neurons that when you look at the firing rate of the neuron uh, versus the head erection of the animal, uh, 
you see that th these are really beautiful examples. They're not all like that. Yeah, but you see that you have a really beautiful tuning, very narrow to a particular direction, particular azimuth. Uh, here are two more examples. Um, now, so head erection cells were found in a whole host of areas, such as the dorsal precipicula, material thalamus, medial trial cortex, and, and a whole host of other areas around the hippocampus. Uh, and they're kind of uh, classically thought to be tuned to head direction and not to position. So they're not place cells, but they're really representing the head direction. Uh, so they fire more or less uniformly with respect to position. Although, in parentheses, I should say that we found, in fact, that uh, in the bat, uh, uh, place cells in the hippocampus also have genuine head direction uh, tuning. And this was also found uh, later in Mayank Mehta's lab in rats. So, so really, there is also directional information in the hippocampus. What we thought as a strict separation, the hippocampus is only about space and not about direction, and surrounding regions are only about direction, not about space. It's not exactly the case. There is some mixture. Certainly there is mixture in the internal cortex. We'll get to this in a second. Uh, but I'm now talking about the classical head direction cells that are kind of not in the hippocampus. They, they, they tend to not care so much about space. And very importantly, I think it's kind of <laughs> related to navigation is this point, that the head direction tuning, by and large, except maybe one, uh, one uh, study, they seem to be stable across the environment and across different environments, seem to be really global. So for example, um, uh, I mean, even here, Anna Smith, right, uh, <laughs> had the poster here, you can go check it out, where uh, there was a, a corridor that's kind of uh, uh, half a, circle and four kind of rooms, small rooms, yeah, boxes in different directions. And across all of this thing, the head direction cell is always pointing in the same direction. I mean, it's not trivial because the, this thing really is, is curved and these different rooms are going in different directions. Still, the head direction cells always point, whatever, east or, or north. And uh, also, Jeff Taube has done a study where rats were in the first floor of an apparatus, then went to the second floor. And again, they were pointing in both, in both floors, they're pointing in the same direction. So except, uh, one study from, from Kate Jeffrey in, in retrosplenial cortex, which has this kind of more weird <laughs> direction cells, but in all other studies, in all, study, in all other brain areas, in all studies, there's really a very strong finding that the head direction uh, 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 coding, or this compass, if you will, <laughs> uh, is extremely stable. So it's a really a global compass. Now, of course, we have no idea if it's compass in the geophysical sense, yeah, if it's uh, you know, magnetic or whatever, but relative to the local room, it seems to be always stable. Yes, and anyway. it's relative to the local room. So, so yeah. these boxes have to be open, and basically the yeah. null reference is in the surroundings. Right. OK, because otherwise, how would they do it? Right. So they're always, these experiments, traditionally, the way you do them is you always have the ceiling open, primarily for technical reasons, because usually the way you do the experiments, you have a cable running out. So if you have a ceiling, that, that's a problem. Uh, but yes, they always see the ceiling, or in mo most cases, they would see also, you know, very prominent things on the walls, etc. So there's very strong visual cues, uh, you know, electrophysiological setups, doors, what have you. So there's a lot of information. But this is really relative to the local room, and we don't know if that's related in any way to, you know, the, the planet. Yes? Uh, is there a difference of head direction cells for upside down postures, like for the bats? Yes. So I'll get to this in my second talk. <laughs> um, so uh, now another interesting fact, uh, unlike the places that I told you, 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 you change. So, so uh, sorry, <laughs> let me go back. So if you rotate the environment, just like with the place cells, if you rot rotate the cylinders, then head direction cells will rotate together. Yeah, so these, you, you, again, you rotate the cue card by 180 degrees, and these two head direction cells rotated together, so they maintain the relations between themselves. So this is kind of makes sense. What's more important is that if you, let's say, remove the, the cue card, or move them to a different room, or do all sorts of manipulations like that, that would elicit remapping in place cells. So they, place cells in the hippocampus will do these weird random stuff. Head direction cells do not do random stuff. They might rotate because now you move the animal to a completely different room, it's a different world, so 
and the, 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 you know, the local cues are completely different, so you know, you'd expect the compass to rotate. You, you did everything you can to disorient the animal, essentially, but they all rotate together. You know, so these two neurons rotated in this, in this uh, strong manipulation, but the difference between them is maintained. So really, it's very strongly uh, yoked together, the remap together, and a classical model that can explain these kinds of findings is the, what's called the ring model of fat erection cells that I will really have the pleasure of not talking about a lot because I'll <laughs> leave that to Vivek Jairaman, but just to tell you the basic idea, this is the model that's been around, I mean this plot is from the 2006, but this model has been around from about 1995, 96 as the leading model of head erection cells, what they do, and the idea there is that you, this is a theoretical model, completely theoretical, the idea is that you have neurons sitting on a ring, so these blue circles are neurons sitting on a ring, and if, a, if one neuron is exciting its neighbors, but then there is global inhibition, then you will have a, 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 a stable bump of activity they will form with kind of all these adjacent neurons being active and all these neurons non-active, and then as the animal starts to rotate, if you have a, an information about angular velocity coming into the system, um, let's say, as the animal starts to rotate left, then uh, there's, if there's information about animal velocity that comes into these neurons, it's kind of move the bump of activity with the movement of the animal. So then this kind of bump of activity will track the movement of the animal. So this model was around, as I said, for more than 20 years as a complete theoretical construct un until, uh, you know, Vivek's lab uh, look at that at, a, at an area called the ellipsoid body in the Drosophila central complex, which looks exactly like that, looks like a torus, and <laughs> it was one of these most amazing things, but it actually turns out that there is a bump of activity there, and it is rotated with the animal movement, and there's also uh, angular velocity inputs to that that rotate exactly as you expect by the model, so really uh, an amazing uh, prediction for mammals that was confirmed in Drosophila, so we'll hear all about that uh, in Vivek's talk uh, tonight. Um, all right, so kind of to, to summarize, so, this con so we have this concept of, of map and compass that came you know, from Kramer in 1953, but you can try to, to kind of uh, map it onto, onto these uh, kinds of neurons, yes, yeah, so you have the, uh, the place cells that might be a sort of a, a map. I'm showing you here kind of one another example of a place cell, really how beautiful it is whenever the animal runs through these particular part of the environment, the neural gets activated, okay, so this will be your map of where, where uh, am I in space. This is in the, uh, in the hippocampus, and then in the presubiculum, for example, or in some other areas, you'll find these, um, these uh, head erection cells, and I guess I should show you this uh, movie that illustrates how a head erection cell is active, so whenever the animal, this is the space, the animal goes through the space, and this is their direction. So the spikes occur in various positions in space, but they always occur in the same angle um, in, in, the, in the head direction uh, space, okay, the head direction uh, coordinates. All right, so, so we have this kind of mapping, I think, of the map and compass c concept from, you know, outdoor kind of navigation to possibly to, um, um, to these neurons. And I'll also say a few words about grid cells and then about some other cells and then I'll summarize. So grid cells is, as you all know, another kind of cell that was discovered by the Mosers uh, a little over a decade ago. So this is an example of a, of a grid cell. If you let a rat run in this um, uh, box and, uh, and the red dots are again spikes and you, you can see that they fall on, a, if you kind of identify where they, the, the fields are, they fall on a roughly hexagonal, uh, um, Lattice, it's not, maybe not exactly hexagonal, but it's roughly hexagonal. Yeah, these are the Moses. We'll have uh, Edward uh, uh, speak tomorrow, and these are um, Marianne Finn and Torkel Hafting, who were the students in these studies. And, um, and so grid cells have several interesting properties. Uh, one is if you look at, in this case, in three uh, simultaneously recorded uh, uh, grid cells on the same tetrode, they seem to have a similar spacing. I mean, they seem to look kind of similar. This is the firing rate map, this is the autocorrelation. They seem to be rather similar to each other, except that you see that there is a shift. There is a, you know, a field here, and it's shifted relative to that one. In fact, if you uh, take uh, three simultaneously recorded neurons and shift them together, you can always kind of align them, or maybe not always, but in many cases you can align them together. So it seems to simultaneously record grid cells in most cases 
will be a kind of replica of each other, same, same wavelength, same spacing, but kind of a shifted versions of each other. Um, so you can have then multiple grid cells kind of tile the environment. And the thinking, at least originally, uh, was the suggestion was that you, know, you can also create place fields from these many grid cells. If you have grid cells, I'll show you in a second that grid cells also come in, in, in uh, multiple scales, then you can combine grid sets of various scales to create place cells. Um, maybe I should actually, uh, I guess I should uh, show you first uh, the, uh, for this to make sense, I should show you that there is a correlation. If you go from dorsal hippocampus to uh, dorsal neuronal cortex to ventral neuronal cortex and you look at the grid spacing, the wavelength, it increases with the, with the dorsal ventral position. So here you have grid cells that are rather small and here you have grid cells that are rather large, and if you, this is by, when you pull many animals together, then you see this clear correlation, and in fact we know that anatomically, this area in dorsal and toronal cortex is connected to dorsal hippocampus where the small place fields are, and this ventral part where the big grid fields are connected to ventral hippocampus where the big place fields are, so it's really high resolution areas connected to the other high resolution area, and, and similarly the low resolution area is connected to the low resolution area in the hippocampus, uh, and uh, by the way, this connectivity is the same across species also in bats. Uh, so then the idea is that you have these neurons that have a kind of high resolution combined together in a kind of Fourier decomposition, create this high resolution place fields and vice versa here. Now, of course, uh, the problem is that you can also, it can also run the other way around, right? Because you can have a kind of an inverse Fourier transform, so maybe the place fields actually are the ones that create the grid cells, because as I said, it's a loop. You have place and cortex projects to the hippocampus, but then back. And there's, in fact, mounting evidence that maybe it is the other way around. And you know, I personally think it's probably, there's a loop, so probably it goes both ways. So place, feel, and uh, there's evidence, I won't go into all details again, it's one of these things where I have no time to go into the details, but there's evidence in both directions. And so both, it's, can, it's probably both true that place cells are indeed creating the root cells, but also the other way around. Um, okay, and as I mentioned, during global remapping, Whereas in the hippocampus, right, if, if you have in room A these cells fire like that, in room B they're you know, completely unrelated to each other, in, with grid cells in completely two different rooms, they will remap, they will rotate, because everything has changed, all the local cues have changed. So of course, you do not expect everything to remain the same, but they remap together, like the head direction cells. So if, if this is in room A, and this is in room B, and this is another neuron in room A, and, not, and the same neuron in room B, and the third neuron, then you'd see that this is, of course, schematic. Yeah, that you see that the relations between them are maintained. Things might be rotated, might be shifted, but the relations are maintained, unlike in the hippocampus. So this is one of the reasons why people think that this is maybe more of where the, the map is, because this seems to be more, more robust. Uh, okay, so they, they shift and rotate together, and I showed you that. And just to say that, in fact, this is what happens if you look at, in, at many animals pulled together, but if you look at individual animals, then it turns out that you have, if you look at one animal, you, you move the tet your tetrode uh, in, in one animal, then you encounter initially placed, this is like pos position uh, with going dorsally to ventral and neuronal cortex. Initially you encounter neurons that have one spacing, then an another discrete spacing, then a third discrete spacing, so these modules very, with very discrete spacings that they are different between different animals. So when you pull together, you see this overall correlation, but within individual animals, you in fact have these discrete spacings. Um, another thing I want you to pay attention to is that grids, uh, there were several studies showing this specifically, but I'm just using this slide to make the point that the grids in a large envi enough environment, a large enough meaning in this case 2.2 .2 by 2.2 .2 meter box, start to become distorted, okay? So if you just, I, I put for you, this looks, this is a beautiful grid, but if you put those lines, if I put those lines for you, you'll see that it's actually not exactly so precise. Uh, there is, this runs like this, but this runs like this. They're not parallel lines. So it's not a perfect grid. And indeed, there are several studies that shows that if you start distorting the geometry of the environment, then the grids is, can start being distorted, or if you just look at a big enough environment, then the grid starts to slowly be distorted. This, of course, immediately raises questions of what happens in really large-scale environments. How much is that the grid cells can be relevant for them? So, for example, this is for you, <laughs> Henrik. So, 
what is the role of grid cells in, in large scale environments? I mean, I don't think we know, but there were several suggestions. One is kind of, you see the eager bird researcher immediately, the year after grid cells have been, uh, have been uh, uh, discovered, right, puts a grid on these infinite environments, it kind of imagines that you'll have these infinite grids and kind of tiling very large scale environments. This is a kind of from a review by Henrik about kind of navigation systems. Uh, this is one option, but of course, first of all, no studies were done on these large scales, no very huge grids were found, and also, if grids get distorted over a 2.2 meter environment, it will be hard to imagine how they will be stable or kind of consistent across very large environments. So this is kind of one option that was raised. Another option is perhaps you don't need very large grids, you can have uh, small grids, but as long as you can have a combination, uh, specific theories that, uh, or models suggested that you can have grids that are in small spacing, small wavelength, but different from each other. So these modules that I showed you that are discrete, if they're indeed kind of periodic across space, this is a grid cell with one wavelength and it's a grid cell with another wavelength, then you can still unambiguously code space because these grids will have their peaks align here, but then the second time the line will be somewhere there, right? So you can unambiguously code very large spaces even with smaller grids. But still, for this to work, this has to be precisely periodic. If it starts to drift and get distorted in large spaces, this will not work either. Yes? Were the distorted grid maps shown in ventral hippocampus? I mean, ventral uh, interaction? The distorted ones, no, are in dorsal. Yeah, well, many questions. Yeah, uh, okay, yes? Um, could it also be that it's maybe a bit naive to the sampling because, I mean, you record based on the time that an animal spent. You know, yeah, I mean, look at that. It's pretty good sampling. I don't know if you see the gray lines. Maybe you don't see it, but there's this pretty thick coverage of a gray line. This is very good. Now, of course, if you go to even larger environment, let's say a four by four meter box that the, 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 there's people now in the Mozilla lab uh, working on that, then you really have to have the animal stay there for several hours to sample space. So it become, there is a sampling issue, but here it's actually good sampling, so it's not because of that. Uh, yeah, Hanna. Do you get improvement like with the place cells in precision of the grid when you have more cues? Like if the arena wall has a you know, nice panorama? Yeah, there? so okay, so there is, first of all, so these distor there were several studies suggested these distortions are caused, caused related to the walls, and for example, there was a study from Lisa Giacomo, a couple of studies showing that near the wall, where there's more information, the animal literally touches the wall, then, then the fields are more reliable. When you go uh, away from the wall, the animal maybe has to path integrate, there's less information, uh, <laughs> then, then things are less reliable. It just makes sense because there's less information in the middle of the environment than near the wall. Yeah. Um, is there any evidence uh, about kind of how systematic this distortion is in the grid cells? So across the different scales of grids, yeah. Because if, like, the reason I ask is because if you have, like, you're saying, yeah. like, if you have this distortion, then you can't have this kind of big scaling. But if the distortion is really systematic, then it yeah. can still work. There's not much information about how, you know, the different models, the different scale, the, how much they distort together or not. But I think th your question actually touches upon a very important question. Because for me, so you can look at that and say, okay, so maybe if the grid is distorted, then the grid cells are not really the metric of space. This could be one interpretation. The other interpretation is maybe they are the metrics of space, but your spatial perception is distorted. So I think it'll be a fascinating and a, v a very difficult experiment, but I think it's possible to do. Uh, the O'Keefe lab has now this uh, uh, honeycomb uh, maze that might be possible to, to use that to address it. But think of the possibility that the animal in those distorted spaces, this is just a box, but also, you know, the Keef lab has done uh, this trapezoidal kind of environment and things got distorted there as well. So if your perception is this of space is distorted here compared to there and the grid cells are also distorted here compared to there in the same way, then maybe, you know, they are the metric of space and are reflecting your spatial perception, right? I think it's an open, a big open question. And of course, the really difficult, if there's one thing we, I hope you learn over the last two days, that behavioral experiments are really difficult. And so measuring <laughs> the spatial perception of like distortion of space in an animal in an open environment, it's a very tricky thing, but people are, are working on that. And I think that as long all the network is distorted in a coherent way, yeah. you will still be able to record it. Right, you can still be able to. The other thing is, of course, it, it can be very distorted, but if it's coherent and consistent, you can decode position, right? It doesn't have to be a perfect lattice.
Yeah, but the third possibility then is that maybe grid cells so have no role in large scale environment. Maybe you know, like in this kilometer scale, things will become completely distorted, and maybe it is only for small scale. It's, oh, it's an open question. We don't really know. Uh, and so again, all these questions about large scale, I'll, I'll address them in, in, the, in, the, in, my, in my talk after the, the break. But the, the, the thing is that, of course, all of these experiments were done in small environments, in small boxes, you know, one meter, two meters, if you think about how many neurons you will need to tile, you know, many kilometers, then it's really, really many neurons, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 15, depending on, on how many, on, on all sorts of assumptions. So, so clearly, things need to be different uh, on large scale, and, and, okay, maybe I'll skip that. Uh, and I'll tell you after the break about how we approach this. We've built this very large environment and trying to address uh, this question in a linear but very large uh, environment, 200 in this case, and hopefully a kilometer long uh, this year. So to summarize uh, what I've told you so far, and then I think I really need to like, start closing in, la in three minutes, uh, four minutes. Um, so I've, I've told you about uh, place cells about that kind of represent my own position, grid cells that can be used to represent position by combining these various modules, these various wavelengths, but they can also be used to represent distance. So it's also another open question whether grid cells, whether the if you take the spatial uh, idea, whether grid cells are used to represent position or distance travel. These are two different things. And I think it's, it's, it's an open question, at least for me. And then there are the head direction cells that are kind of the, the compass, at least with respect to local cues, and the border cells, which are really decided <laughs> I have no time to, to touch upon, but these are another kinds of neurons that are encoding one or several walls of the environment, and there are two flavors of them. It's kind of confusing. There are border cells in trial cortex, and there are boundary cells in, in, in the subiculum, and there's a debate whether it's the same thing or not, but we won't go into that. But th th these are neurons that seem to encode essentially the geometry of the environment. So for example, they may be involved in this reset that I mentioned. As you approach the wall, things to be, the grid seem to be more stable as opposed to the center, so maybe those border cells are used, the information from the border cell is used to uh, kind of uh, um, uh, constrain your, your error in the grid cell. But you know, you can also use just sensor information because you touch environment, you know, direct sensor information could do that as well. Uh, yeah, so to summarize, place cell encode position, where am I, grid cells, the position or distance, uh, border cells, the borders of the environment, so these can be thought of kind of composing sort of a map. I mean, again, I don't necessarily mean an Euclidean map, although grid cells, if you look at them, they seem to be pretty Euclidean, so uh, it, at least uh, by the look of them. And then the head direction cells and code direction, so this could be a kind of a compass. So this is kind of the mapping between the concepts of, you know, the navigation outdoors to, the con to the, these neural cell types. Uh, so let me, I mean, I have really literally uh, uh, two th or three slides of other cell types just to mention them. Uh, that are cell types that are related to navigation. So I mentioned already the border of boundary cells. Uh, then there are speed cells in medial toronto cortex discovered a couple of years ago that uh, could be important, for example, for path integration. If you have very reliable speed information, it could be very useful for path integration. And then um, another kind of cell that I'll actually talk more in the after the break, but all of these cells had to do with where I am and the locally distance travel, but where, how our goals represent in the brain. Uh, so uh, Ayelet, who's sitting here, uh, asked this question, and we found she found neurons that encode the uh, the direction relative to the goal. So actually, uh, kind of a vector towards the goal. We'll see. I'll, I'll show you more of that after the break. I think I need to skip that. And then this is really my last slide. Some open questions uh, for me, at least. You can, I'm sure, put more questions here. But one is has to do with the hippocampus and space, so there is this gap in spatial scale. All the neurons that I've showed you so far were recorded in really small environments. Then animals, even rats, navigate over about a kilometer. There are studies that show that rats can go up to one kilometer per night. So this gap in spatial scale between one meter and one kilometer in a rat, or one meter and a, a few tens of kilometers in a bat, you know, not to speak of, of thousands of kilometers that let's say some bats go through, it's a huge gap, and we really don't know and, uh, how that uh, is related. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of our attempts to get at that. Then the neural basis of goal-directed navigation, I think, is an open question. Uh, we'll talk about that. But really, all these cells uh, 
that were studied so far had to do with where I am right now and where is north, and, or like local north, let's say, the room north. Uh, but how do we get to goals? We know very little. We started working on that as well. I'll tell you that in the, after the break. And then there's more general questions. I mentioned already uh, some of them, the hippocampus. Is it about space or about memory? Um, so there are that, these ideas that maybe the hippocampus is more general machine to encode sequences. So if your animal navigates through space and you get spatial representation, but if an animal goes through some other sequences, then you get other representation. For example, there was a recent study from uh, Dmitry Aronov and David Tank where they had the kind of a sound sequences and then they found hippocampal neurons that encoded sounds, sound frequencies. So you can create situations where you get other representations in the hippocampus. And in fact, and, uh, you know, one of the ideas is, and you go, these are things are, um, of course, these evolutionary arguments are, are hard uh, uh, to verify, but one of the ideas, uh, for example, proposed by Buzaki and, and Edward Moser, but also others, that maybe this was an ancient hippocampus, as I said, it's very ancient in mammals, so of course, exists, a homologue of this exists in other vert vertebrates, uh, you know, maybe it was an ancient mapping system because you know really to get from point A to point B is crucial for survival but then you kind of uh, the, there was a system that can learn flexibly relations between spatial position and create sequences of positions but then once you have the machinery to do that flexibly then you can hijack it for other stuff uh, to create uh, episodic memories to create uh, all sorts of other things right so you have a machinery for flexibly learning uh, relations in space, it is evolutionarily important, then you can use that to create other stuff. And that might explain some of the differences that people find between rats and humans. In humans, you know, maybe the hippocampus has been hijacked also to do other stuff. Hijacked in the, <laughs> in the good sense, yeah. Okay, so this is another open question. Then, as I said, past versus future, there's open questions there. Whether the hippocampus has only to do with spatial memory, things about the past, or also about planning for the future. There's evidence for both, and there's an interesting link in general, I think in past versus future when we talk about memory systems. And the la last point is, as I already mentioned, putting it all together. So we have this taxonomy of neurons and neurons that encode position, neurons that encode uh, um, you know, distance travel, directions, directions to goals, but now to navigate is a much more complicated stuff, right? You need to plan a, a route, execute it, then you have obstacles, you need to go around them, you need to reorient yourself. It's a lot of things that are involved in that. And how is all that all put together to actually navigate? We have very, very little knowledge about that. So I think this is a major open question for uh, our field for years to come. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much.